for, oh my gosh, what, like 15, 16 years since you were a kid, almost, you know? And uh, the project that Blake is doing on the history of storm chasing is amazing. And when you hear some of the folks and some of the things that he's done as part of his research, uh, it, it's just incredible. Without further ado, Blake Nassar. Thank chasers and uh, history right here. I mean, this is uh, why I'm doing the project, because of everyone that has an interest in severe weather. And, uh, you know, it's it's great to just see everyone's enthusiasm. You know, so I, I'll just get right into it uh, about what this project is. It's an anthology. It's basically, instead of focusing on storms, it's chasing chasers through history. It is chronicling about six decades of storm chaser activity from the very first person through to what it's become now. And you know, look at these images here. This, uh, this comprises, oh, this goes back at least to 1976, you know. Here's two of the originals right up here. Uh, Randy Zipser and David Hoadley, uh, probably in Northern Oklahoma at that point. You know, and it just broadens out. Uh, some of you might be in this uh, uh, homage or something right now. I see Roger right there. Jim Leonard. So, so many memories have just been made over the years. And it's, uh, that's what this project is. It's just putting this all together. So what is it? I just mentioned it's a six decade uh, documentary film series starting from 1956, going to about 2014, 2015. And it's told through uh, storm chasers, meteorologists, and uh, their families, siblings, uh, people that are affected by uh, you know, our hobby. And, uh, basically, uh, the goal is to uh, get it done. And uh, right now, it's just an immense undertaking. It's just me and uh, a lot of other people contributing video and film. But I'd really like to get it out to a uh, broadcast media, uh, preferably, you know, like PBS or an independent film channel, somewhere that would actually enjoy having an in-depth series about chasers that isn't just over-dramatized uh, stuff that you'd see on reality TV. You know, it's just actual stories growing out of stories, and it's just there's um, many. Outside of that, it's, uh, it's my goal down the line to create a comprehensive digital cloud archive of everyone's material and just make that available and just preserve it for everyone to enjoy. Uh, because inevitably, you know, things change, things get forgotten about, thrown out, and we're in that age where, you know, we're, we're going from analog into digital and we're converting the mass quantities of it. So that's, uh, that's down the line, that's what this is really all about, preservation and history. And there, like I said, there's a lot of it. Um, <laughs> all sorts of formats, from movie film to uh, various formats of videotapes, slides, stills. Uh, it's just, it's immense. There, there's piles around my apartment that uh, I don't know how uh, my girlfriend is tolerating, you know, it just being scattered about the apartment at certain times. It just it's, looks like a tornado. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's a great test. But, you know, some people might be like, I just, why preserve it? Why, it's, it's ancient history, you know, it's, who cares? I mean, I know some people don't give a rat's, you know, about history whatsoever. They just, like, we all live in the moment, but it's important to preserve it because it's our history, it's our roots, it's how we all evolved with our interests, you know, no matter where you started, you know. It's, uh, it's just showing what we've learned and it shares the wealth of <laughs> what we've all provided over the years with future generations and each other. You know, it's something just to be happy and proud about. It's, it's what we all love. 
David Hoadley. This is the first storm chaser. If you don't know him, uh, and I say modern age storm chasing because he was the first person, whether he cares to admit it or not, that got in a car with an idea of a forecast, with a camera and some maps, and drove west. And from there, it grew. But most people didn't know about other people back in 1956. He was age 17 when he first began doing this. And then it exploded over the years. It just evolved. It's about 50, hundreds of people. And now there's thousands of us that do the same thing. So many stories to just put together and build off of each other. It's a, it's a matrix of stories. And just a little quick info on how this all came about, who I am. I mean, why am I doing this project? I mean, it's, it goes back to my childhood. I love tornadoes and severe weather. And I'm from uh, Michigan, which gets occasional severe weather events here and there. Um, but, you know, it started like for about 50 or 70 percent of the people that I talked to on this journey. Uh, it started with like a, a key event, something triggered that interest, whether it was their parents telling them about it or if it was experiencing it firsthand, it was, you know, something that, you know, kicked them in the butt and was like, let's just, <laughs> let's do this for a, you know, a hobby for the rest of their lives. And then as time wore on and I grew up, I started developing a love for cinematography and cameras and so weather and history and cameras all merged in. Um, you know, it just it got to this point. This was my keynote event, the May 13th, 1980 Kalamazoo, Michigan tornado. And I wasn't born yet. I was born in 1981. My mom told me about this tornado. It, uh, it was the first tornado, actually, I found out years later to be recorded on videotape. And uh, it goes right through my hometown, uh, goes right through my neighborhood. And I go ahead and play the video, I just, well, I'm talking here. It's going through my childhood neighborhood here, and I, my mom was just downtown witnessing this, and she would tell me all these stories about it coming over the buildings, and she would, instead of multiple vortices, two tails, you know, whipping around each other, debris flying in the air. I was hooked, I was fascinated by this event. And uh, as time wore on, jump ahead here, a year later, this special comes out, where many people were introduced to storm chasing through Nova Tornado, produced by PBS WGBHT. This, you know, was the first, I think this is the reason why I demanded to have a VCR. I, my parents were hedging on it, and I heard that this was airing in November, and I just wanted it taped, so my uncle taped it for me. And then we got the VCR that Christmas, and I would just, I don't know how everyone else is around here. Like, does, who in this room likes to watch severe weather videos over and over and over again? <laughs> <laughs> Look at them, yeah. And what, I'll just open question, what age did, uh, raise some hands, what age did some people start out doing that with, like, four? Yeah. So childless, yeah, you're, everyone's, not everyone, but good, vast majority of people are just developing early childhood obsessions. And through this Overwatch special, which I memorized from the back, I developed role models early on at age five. This, this crazy haired man right up here, Howie Bluestein. Uh, I love this guy. Fascinated by what he was doing. He seemed so friendly, too. And then Lou Wicker was uh, just Mr. Intense. He, he was just, just all over the place in that special. He was yelling. And, uh, <laughs> these are two interesting characters that I had no idea that years down the line I would get to meet and to interview, let alone have lunch with. I, it was wonderful. Um, yeah, and this spawned on, I'll just keep going through here. Uh, I would draw. I, the, the, the obsession just kept going. I, I would draw, this is a, a Doppler radar imagery from a WSR-74 from the NOVA special. 
And this is an earlier attempt at storm uh, relative uh, velocity. <laughs> My geography is all screwed up here because you see OUM, which I guess was University of Oklahoma Mormon, something like that. <laughs> Chicago is right here. Wichita Falls, which is uh, WTF. <laughs> You know, I'm watching Sesame Street. This program, AM Weather's area, right before it, I start taking it. I love what it's doing. It's a, the only form of weather information that you can get at that point in time. Then we get the Weather Channel the next year, and Mr. Vince Miller right here isn't doing the weather. It's uh, <laughs> what a small world this is, because you know, I, I would just watch him and many others. It's a, it was a good, uh, good influence, to say that much. Uh, didn't mean to skip ahead too much there. Uh, 1986, the year after that, my mom visited uh, the National Severe Storms Forecast Center, which used to be located in Kansas City, the CELS unit, and she brought home these pamphlets, uh, mainly on the Wichita Falls, Texas tornado, April 10th, 1979. And uh, you know, I just had more material, glued to it. I'm obsessed, officially. Bedtime reading, I don't know if anyone remembers this book. Uh, it was poems about the Xenia, Ohio tornado of uh, April 3rd, 1974. And uh, my dad would read this to me. And so I'm developing you know, this interest of history and historical events. Uh, please play the video, because my mom that same year made this flip book, Animation of the Calendars of Michigan Tornado, just to showcase what she witnessed. And you know, she gave that to me, and I guess that's one of the earliest forms that I remember the documentation of a tornado, because I had newspapers, I had snow special, and uh, books just checking out of the library. It was the 80s, there was no real internet at that time. Uh, but jumping ahead here, and this is where many come into play, the connectivity age of the internet since the mid-1990s uh, really opened up many doors for me. And not just in terms of networking and meeting other chasers, but there were so many new platforms coming onto the, the fray. AccuWeather had this AccuData thing that I ran up a $219 phone bill in a modem when I downloaded weather data. It was canceled like the following week. Tornado Video Classics was out there. Tom Grizzoulis put out this excellent series that he and Roy Britt worked on for ages. These were just ways to see other tornado videos and knowing that other people were out there chasing and uh, really great material. Of course, Storm Track Magazine, which began in 1977 with David Holy as a newsletter and then was later taken on by Tim Marshall in uh, 1986. Uh, I subscribed to that, many of you probably did too. It, uh, these were the ways to talk to chasers and network. It was <laughs> writing to each other swapping videotapes. The internet was big, CompuServe got on that. Gilbert Sabetze's Storm Chaser homepage, sorry if I butchered your last name, Gilbert. Uh, these were just all mediums. Technology was coming together. It was also, right around that time, three popular movies came out, one of which was, you know, the Hollywood blockbuster Twister. But uh, other, you know, spin-offs that same year were these were, these were influential to most of some people out there. And uh, with, who in this room was influenced by Twister, just out of curiosity? Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, that was the exposure for a lot of people, uh, was that Hollywood film. Now, the internet's going on. So, being like 15 years old or so, I, I really just decided to start investigating who was out there. So I started contacting people. These three, uh, four individuals actually up here, wrote to them, swapped videotapes, and just networked. This was a good way to learn about chasing in the 90s, swapping videos, watching tapes religiously. And so over time, tapes just began piling up. Uh, a lot of these, maybe there were about 50, but I just loved the, the 
history aspect. And it was very interesting to see some chasers were documenting other chasers. David Hoadley was doing it. Uh, occasionally Jim Leonard would uh, toss a camera on to people. But every so often, I just like seeing the chasers more than the storms. The storms were great, especially if you were there and then you could see another angle. But I like the human aspect of it, too. And so, you know, videos not only you know, exposed me to the human side of chasing, but it developed friendships. It was great for networking. It got me through the winter, all those lake effect events. It was just brutal. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's all about insight and education. So the following year, first storm chase right down the road for me. I witnessed a tornadic supercell. Went on to produce a weak tornado in uh, Portage, Michigan. And uh, you know, it's, it's great. Data is coming around at that point in time. It's, yeah, I'm kind of losing my pacing here, but uh, what I was getting at there, <laughs> when I'm starting to chase, now I'm starting to document other people. I'm documenting the, the friends that I'm chasing with high school, from high school with, and uh, just swapping those videos with other chasers. It's, it's a human aspect that just I'm continuously drawn to. And this is kind of where this project started. I didn't know I was wanting to do a documentary film on chasers or whatnot. I just naturally would, you know, videotape people. So I started working the storm chase tour scene in the early 2000s and chasing on my own. And that opened up a whole uh, a lot of doors and interesting characters and whatnot and various events. And so this all got compiled over the years. And from about 1998 through 2008, that 10 year period, I was just amassing tons of material. And so I emailed uh, Tim Marshall, David Hoadley, and Randy Zipser uh, about a documentary, just a, a quick little documentary, 30 or 60 minutes on the humanity of storm chasing. People were like, you're amassing so much material, why not do something like this? And uh, it was a great idea at the time. And at the same point, though, I'm going to college, I get a bit sidetracked here and there. I did not have clear focus on what I really wanted to do, and uh, over time, you know, things just kind of slowed down, but it didn't stop me from documenting. Now, this is an original excerpt from the first documentary, which it wasn't formal, it was just me going around, it was very off-the-cuff shooting video of people. This was actually at an Iowa NWA conference in uh, 2004, on the 26th of March, and if you go ahead and play the video, I'll just give you an example of how the shooting style works. How deep is the moisture? That's 200 in central Oklahoma. Yeah, four. I, I wouldn't rule out that things might happen a little Right. That's what I'm thinking too, which is like, and then two hours from there. It just seems like this. Nonchalant scenes, getting ready. I-40 is south. be my guess. Yeah, small line to the north, and hopefully isolated supercells to the south. We chased that day. We all abandoned the last day of this conference to drive overnight to central Oklahoma and see severe weather the next day and caught some tornadoes. It was a wonderful start to the 2004 season. And I had no idea, you know, here's Tim and Carl, you know, I'm just sitting next to him and talking to him. I had no idea what was going to happen down the road, but you know, they were a part of this original concept. Uh, but over time, this was a common question. Please play this video. What do I do? Okay, the dog is sitting in a, in a big box somewhere. <laughs> yes, Jay Angel, you were correct. It is and was just sitting in a big box, being moved from apartment to apartment, and nothing was being done with it. It was just collecting dust. So uh, after that. Um, I got into uh, the media field, I finished school, and then I went full-time into broadcast TV, and I just, the project got um, put on the back burner, you know, sat around in boxes, did nothing. And 2013 came along, and I was tired of moving around all this videotape. Uh, I wasn't doing anything, but I put it on YouTube, and a uh, you know, little video here and there, but overall I was running out of space, so time for the Great Purge. 2013, mass digitization of all various formats, everything else in the trash. 
saved the best stuff. Uh, fortunately, I didn't get rid of uh, vital pieces of video, but I was just not doing anything with it. This is uh, about January 2013. Um, that year, didn't chase at all. Worked, worked in the media. And then May 31st, 2013 happens. And the, I didn't know what had happened until two days later. Uh, this was the first thing, this was the first news I saw about it on an NPR website on June 2nd. And I was just speechless. Uh, two people I knew now had fallen victim to a tornado, as many of us knew that none of us expected it to be them. Uh, that immediately sent me back to those boxes that were just piled up. And I went back to that day. I found the video that Tony Laubach shot. It's on VHS cassette. And uh, I played it. And uh, go ahead and play the video. I just paused it on a few of the images. I looked at Tim and Carl, and I was like, Nine years has passed, and now they're dead? What? I couldn't believe it. So, over time, I started expanding that original concept that was just sitting in the closet. And uh, basically, I had already possessed all the material that I needed to make this. I just uh, lacked the interviews. And, uh, just seemed like the right time. People were aging. Uh, Tim, Carl, and Paul, they had passed away. Um, it, was, it was important. It was like, it's now or never, and you might as well do this. So I started throwing, throwing this together just one night and making phone calls to people, uh, including uh, Randy Zipser, who was one of the first people that really, you know, just encouraged me to do this. And at the same time, I have this long conversation with him. He's trying to get rid of all his uh, videos. He's moving, he's downsizing. That's his thing. And so he, after the major purge of 2013, all those videos that I didn't think I needed, I get them back. I get them right back in seven boxes, hundreds of videotapes, slides, <laughs> so much. It was wonderful and uh, very, very helpful to piece together history. I started collaborating with others. I, you know, called up Holy uh, through Roger Edwards, you know, a childhood uh, role model of mine as well. Uh, his wife, Elka, was a website designer, and so we all started talking. How, how could we make a Storm Chaser history website? Because this is the project I'm trying to do. Uh, it just worked out that way, and it was wonderful. I'm you know, forever indebted to them. Uh, and Elka created this page. StormChasingHistory.net. Uh, it was the first thing to really get out there, uh, something about this project. And from there, the only way to really get this going was through a crowdsourcing campaign, Kickstarter. I was kind of doubtful about it because I had seen other Kickstarter campaigns just flop and some really succeeded. Now they're very popular. But people just kept encouraging me. And so I went for it, set a very minimal limit, $7,000 was the lowest price that I could calculate to travel around the country to interview people. And within days, it met its mark and then went over. It, so if, I know some of you in this room back this project, and anyone who's watching, thank you for doing that. It, uh, this would not be happening without anyone's support. <coughs> So, the cross-country excursion begins. I rented this little old Chevy Cruze and uh, packed my bags. Camera gear was loaned out to me by uh, Doug Keesling and Jordan Compagna. Uh, other gear, it was, it was all donated. I didn't have to spend any money on gear. That was wonderful. So thankful for that. And uh, I just took to the road. <laughs> September 7th, I took to the road, starting here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And it might be hard to see on this map, but 
I just made my way through southern Ontario, up through the east coast, down the east coast, through Florida, deep south, uh, of course Texas, Oklahoma, the plains, uh, just interviewing people. I wanted to make a trek out to California, but I spent too much time in Norman. I, I wondered why. I just, <laughs> this is the Mecca, and I just had so many people to talk to there. But there you go, 26 states, two countries, 46 days straight interviewing 73 people. That, and couch surfing all the time. It was uh, occasionally, you know, there'd be a hotel in there. But it, uh, it was an adventure. It accomplished quite a bit. So the, the, the process, though, was just that. There were about two to three interviews per day. And sometimes those interviews would be between one and three hours, with like 15 minute breaks in between. Great for material, very tiring though. So you'd get up in the morning and uh, just go at it. Here's uh, interviewing Tim Marshall at his home right there. And you know it would just be get up and go, talk to the folks, and uh, get on the road again. There was uh, really no downtime, no leisure time to catch a breath. It was a lot of work. And I was just really happy to do it, but uh, you know, this wasn't a vacation. And it really connected me to people that uh, are no longer here, uh, especially those that I had known for a while. Jim Leonard uh, passed away uh, this year, oh, excuse me, la late last year. And I, I got to know him, as many people did, uh, just as storm chasing legend. You know, he, he had done it all, seen it all, and was one of the most friendliest people you could ever meet. And he would just call me up sometimes and just we'd have long conversations uh, about chasing, what the season was going to be like, uh, and just his history. And he, it was so wonderful though to get to see him and have him be a little part of this project. Mike Tice, another close friend of his, and I all got together at his uh, hospice care and conducted an interview. And his spirits were so lifted. He, he truly loved doing this. He basically, it was all storms and wind for him. I mean, he would do anything to make that a reality for him. Deliver pizzas, mow lawns, do odd jobs. This was Jim. And uh, he's one of the other reasons I'm also doing this project because as we lose, important figures uh, over the years, you know, their memory should be preserved. It shouldn't just go into a bin or, or whatnot. It's, it's telling their stories. So fortunately, Mike and Jim were able to recount several stories and his, his memory will definitely live on. So, as the trip kept going, more stuff kept being uh, given to me. <laughs> that Chevy Cruze filled up really quickly documents, newspapers, slides, videotapes. I had to ship five boxes home. It, it was great. Um, so there's a lot to sort through. However, because of the age of certain formats, there are many challenges, like tape breaks, VCRs go down all the time, film deteriorates, it's just been sitting in attics. Uh, there, just in its own right, preserving the material is, is hard enough. And if you can roll this film, Chuck Doswell shot this on the 29th of May, 1980, in Wellington, Kansas. At least that's what the canister was related. And this is the quality, this is 16 millimeter film, but it's deteriorated. It's stuck to each other. I had to physically unstick the film and it has yet to be cleaned off. But uh, that's one of the, the things that I'm trying to uh, preserve, just Events like this, and did anyone in this room chase this event? No one? Does anyone remember it? I mean, it, I guess it's only important for those who were there, but uh, those who told me the stories of it, there it is. I mean, it's, it's worthwhile preserving if it uh, tells a story. So moving forward, uh, this, the Kickstarter was totally utilized up through December. Now it's completely out of pocket. It's done through private donations and primarily relying on shooting weather video. So it's all on the, the mercy of the atmosphere right now and doing freelance work. So it's, uh, 
It's tough, but it's progressing gradually uh, in little increments. Um, there are uh, potential grants that I could apply for that I haven't, but in time, you know, I feel this project's got enough momentum that it'll just keep going, and hopefully I'll have something by the end of this year to put out. And so, just to give you a little taste of uh, what this is all about, I've, uh, I've cobbled together some of the moments from the, uh, the trip, along with some historical video. And uh, not, not all the 73 people that have thus far participated will be included in this. There's still many more interviews to go. But uh, this will give you a taste of, I hope, of what I'm trying to do here. And I'll just jump to a slide, and I'll let you play the video. Testing, testing one.